Okay, so this next talk by B. Dale is about open avionics for high-powered model rockets. If you want to ask any questions, please wait until you get a microphone. So, peace, love, and rockets. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to all of you for hanging around to hear this sort of last real talk session on the last day always uh, is a challenge to get the energy level up for. Um, this really is just sort of a something I do for fun that other people seem to find interesting too kind of talk. Don't look for any hugely deep social significance or Debian project, you know, release schedule insights or anything like that. Um, I've been asked about the title. This is actually um, the, the motto of our local rocketry club in Colorado Springs and in fact that's not something I put together in the GIMP. That's a uh, photo taken of one of the club t-shirts um, used as a background here. Um, <clears throat> I've been accused over the years, I think pretty accurately, as having as my principal hobby turning all of my other hobbies into open source projects. And uh, this is sort of another example of that. Out of curiosity, how many of you have seen me talk about rockets or satellites or something like that before? I went back and looked in my notes, and the first DebConf I ever went to was DebConf 2 in Toronto, uh, just after I was elected Debian project leader. And <clears throat> at that time, I gave a talk that was explaining how it was that I had come to be involved in Debian. And one of the things I pointed to was the fact that it was an amateur radio satellite project that had caused me to first discover uh, Debian. Then, um, I think it was in... Um, Brazil, which would have been DebConf 4, uh, that I gave a talk about the satellite project that uh, had by that time uh, gotten essentially to completion. Um, and then several times since then I've talked about satellite or rocketry projects as, as sort of fun things on the side. For the last couple of years, um, my son and I have been very involved in playing with model rockets. My son is nine years old, and you'll get to see a photo or two of him uh, later in the stack. But what I really want to do this afternoon is, is give you sort of a gentle introduction to this model rocketry hobby, at least as we practice it in the United States. Um, talk a little bit about the role of avionics, which are electronics designed for use inside uh, these sorts of uh, hobby rockets. Um, and talk about some of the products that already exist out there that I've had uh, some personal experience using. And then I want to introduce this uh, project that I started called Altus Metrum. One of my daughters in the audience is a Latin student. She gives me a hard time about um, mixing genders and tenses and things, but I like it this way, so tough. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the tools I used because I'm one of those um, folks that in order to really have fun at my hobby, I find myself often doing things the hard way in order to make a point. And this is another one of those times where everything I used uh, for tools were open source as well. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about where we are and some future plans. So what's this whole basic idea about? Well, we like to build, launch, and successfully recover hobby-sized models of rockets. Um, there are a bunch of elements of this hobby that I think make it really interesting. First of all, it's another place where there's sort of an ongoing learning process. Every time you build another rocket and try some new stunt, um, you learn something in the process. And as my son says, it's loud science. <coughs> he has a t-shirt, in fact, that says, you know, um, be quiet, we're practicing loud science or something like that. Um, I really like things where there's sort of pr a progressive level of technical achievement, by which I mean the more time you spend and the more things you do, the more you learn, the more you can share with other people, and uh, the more sort of sophisticated things can get. There is a huge element of craftsmanship involved in designing and building the actual rockets. You'll see uh, a couple of photos of things being built in a few minutes. And then I really enjoy the camaraderie that comes from collaborating with other enthusiasts in local clubs and at regional launches. The spirit among people in this hobby is actually very similar to the spirit that we experience here at something like DevConf. A lot of people all interested in the same thing, working together to learn more and have a good time. And 
every time people in the rocketry world start to do more sophisticated things, um, they end up incorporating electronics and software. Now, there are several different categories of participation in hobby rocketry, and even though there are lots of different things you can play with, like rocket-launched gliders and radio-controlled planes and stuff like this, the way that people usually delineate the different classes of participation is almost entirely on the basis of how big the motors are. I guess that's not surprising, you know, big motors, big rush, um, big money, all those things kind of go together. We talk about model rockets as being uh, the little rockets. Um, I don't know how many of you had the opportunity, but uh, some of us as kids played with SDs or Quest model rocket kits, put them together and flew them with little pre-manufactured motors. Out of curiosity, how many of you have had a chance to do that at some point in your life? It's pretty cool. It's actually, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, you, hopefully you would all agree, it's a fun thing to do. We generally talk about this category of model rockets as being everything up through about D motors. Uh, the letter prefix in the motor classification is a rough indication of how powerful the motor is. A motors in the sort of Estes nomenclature are up to two and a half newton seconds of total impulse and um, each letter prefix is a doubling. So by the time you get to D you're talking, you know, enough power to carry a a couple hundred gram rocket up a few hundred feet. Um, those are typically rockets that are sort of in the 10 to 24 millimeter motor diameter. The rockets themselves are usually a little bigger than that. There's then a category called mid-power rockets, which is where my son, I think, currently has the most fun. These are rockets that can easily be, you know, uh, two, three feet long, um, a couple of inches in diameter, you know, however many centimeters that works out to, and are in the sort of EF and G motor range. It's possible with a G motor and a 29 millimeter motor casing to carry a rocket that weighs, I don't know, um, 500 grams or so to carry that up uh, eight or 900 meters above ground level. So um, that's, that's getting to be fairly serious toys. It's not the kind of thing you do in your own backyard very often. These are the kinds of things you tend to go to some sort of an organized club launch for. But then the things that I've been spending the most time with are high-powered rockets, and these have motors whose diameters are anywhere from about 29 to 150 millimeters, um, and they start at 160 newton seconds of total power and go up from there. Um, there are different levels of certification, and in order to buy and fly this kind of commercially prepared motor, you have to be certified, and for some of the larger ones, if you're going to store them overnight, in the U.S. at least, you have to get a license uh, uh, from, the, uh, a, uh, from the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. So I am, in fact, a licensed user of low explosives with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I have an explosives magazine on my property <coughs> in Colorado, and the ATF gets to come and inspect it every once in a while. In fact, I'm told with the upcoming Democratic National Convention being in Denver that I should expect an extra inspection. Um, there's then a whole other category, which are uh, research or experimental rockets, sometimes called EX rockets. And what differentiates these is that they're using homemade motors and not commercially produced motor uh, reload kits. There is um, a significant difference in the risk that's involved when you start building motors yourself. And part of the reason this whole hobby rocketry thing has been so wildly successful in recent years is that the um, consistency and predictability of behavior of the commercially produced motors has gotten to be really quite good. And therefore, it's reasonably safe to, to build and fly these things, even when there are kids involved. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, on the other hand, my daughter is uh, uh, now interested in working with me to, to make some motors. So, I don't know, we'll probably play with that too over time. This is a photo from a while back of um, some of what, I guess at the time it was sort of the family portrait of the various rockets that my son and I had in our possession at that time. The biggest one on there, which is the one that's yellow, black, and red, is a 98 millimeter um, airframe with a 38 millimeter motor mount. The little red one to its right um, is my son's favorite rocket of that era, which is uh, Oh, it's a 2.6 inch diameter, whatever that works out to, 50, 60 some millimeters with a 29 millimeter motor mount. 
Um, and as you can see, we had a bunch of little SDs ones. There's an interesting one over in the right somewhere. It's hard for me to pick out from here that's interesting because it was actually made out of rolled paper. Um, and I mentioned the craftsmanship. These are some photos of my son about a year or so ago um, working on one of the rockets, uh, sanding fins, uh, marking a body tube. Uh, uh, as you see, this particular rocket was sort of interesting. Down in the lower right, it's got five fins. Um, there's something optically strange about trying to get the fins aligned right when there's five of them. Somehow our brains are used to dealing with things divided in three and in four, and when you try to figure out if they actually look straight or not when there's five, at least for me it was a real challenge, but that turned out to be a rocket that he really likes. It's called a Sky Torpedo with a 24 millimeter motor mount. Uh, it can fly on either the largest Estes black powder motors or some of the smaller uh, composite propellant motors. Another thing that I, I, I really like um, when I'm doing hobby things is to combine hobbies. And one of the other things I like to play around with is uh, computer control uh, of m milling machines and related uh, uh, metalworking tools. This is a small tabletop milling machine that I'm using to cut centering rings uh, for centering the motor mount tube in the body tube uh, for a custom rocket. These are being cut out of uh, seven or eight millimeter thick plywood um, using a, uh, I guess it's about a two and a half or three millimeter cutting bit. And there are a couple of interesting things that you can do when you cut centering rings yourself. For example, you notice there's some slots cut in the ring. Uh, this is so that the fins, which are being mounted through the wall of the outer tube, can be locked into the fins, and I get perfect alignment of the fins without having to stare at them very hard and figure it out. And there are also a couple holes that have been drilled in there for mounting hardware, since this is the aft ring that goes at the back of the rocket. We put some mounting screws in there so that we can screw down the, the motor assemblies and hold those in place when we're flying. And uh, as a consequence of this, I've actually ended up writing a, per, a Python library that emits G-code, which is sort of the assembly language of machine control. And so when I go to uh, create a new rocket, I sit down and in a few minutes I can whip out a, a Python script that will emit G-code to cut the rings with however many fins and the different diameters and so forth. There's nothing terribly complicated about this, but I have to tell you, my friends in the rocketry hobby just drool when they see me walk in with you know, <laughs> it's no, it's not packaged because unfortunately, this is one of those classic examples of something that's very specifically tied to the particular little milling machine. Which, in, since I took this picture, in fact, I've reworked this one to have a much stronger motor. It can cut rings much faster than it used to. Um, all of it is stuff I would happily share. And in fact, I'm thinking about writing an article for one of the model rocketry magazines about how I do this. Um, and then I realized I could actually also submit it to one of the, uh, uh, there's a magazine now called Digital Machinist, which is all about uh, people playing with these tools at home. And um, I don't know, I love it when I can create a talk or write an article or something and have it be applicable in lots of different places. You get multiple credit for you know, doing one piece of work. Um, unfortunately, I don't think this is showing up terribly well on the screen. Um, so I won't spend much time on it, but when you go to fly big rockets, you need big, wide open spaces to do it. I will admit that on the bus coming down from the airport in Buenos Aires, I kept looking out the window going, this would be a great place to fly rockets. <laughs> nice, big, open spaces, relatively flat, not hard to find things. This is a photo taken in the evening uh, in the northeast corner of the state of Colorado in the United States in an area called the Pawnee National Grasslands. We have a launch site there uh, where we routinely have what's called a standing waiver with the Federal Aviation Ad Administration allowing us to launch uh, during the organized launches there to up to 20,000 feet above ground level. And with some advance notice, uh, we can call in short windows where we can have permission to go up to 34 or 35,000 feet. Um, and this is a big grassy area that's, you know, many, many uh, square miles of, of territory. And so when we go there, it's really far from anything else. We tend to camp out and spend the night uh, sleeping out on the prairie. And that's also a fun thing to do with your, with your son. Um, some of the launch sites aren't quite so remote, though. This is one that we go to down in the, uh, uh, 
southwestern part of Colorado. You'll notice in the background we have an audience. Um, that's a bunch of cattle. Um, and the only problem with the cows is they tend to like to come up around where the launch area is and they leave um, hazardous waste deposits on the ground that we have to look out for. But um, I I'll tell you that after you launch a rocket or two, they're gone. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they don't hang around for this. On the other hand, there are other animals in Colorado that aren't quite as skittish. Um, another one of the launch sites uh, up in the central part of the state, uh, which for those of you who enjoy uh, animated TV stuff, this is actually in South Park, which is, you know, the scene of the South Park adult cartoon thing. Um, it's a working buffalo ranch. I mean, they, you know, these are American bison that are raised for uh, as a meat animal in that part of the world. And uh, this one got a little frisky. Um, my son laughs every time I show this photo because at the back of my uh, sub Chev Chevrolet Suburban, I was standing in the back and I had the doors closed around me hoping the buffalo would go away before I you know, got pronged or something. But um, we're pretty successful at sharing the, the grasslands with them. And uh, it, it, is, it, it does make it sort of amusing sometimes when we go out. So what about avionics? I'm <coughs> the avionics are, are um, something I've gotten very interested in. And what, what you initially think about using these for is control of the recovery system. The way these rockets work is there's a motor that you ignite electrically on the ground that you know, launches the rocket and takes it up. I'll actually show you a video of one of those sometime soon. And when uh, it's done, when, when the motor burns out, there's then sort of a period of time where the rocket's coasting and trading velocity for altitude. And then at some time later, you, as it goes over at apogee, there's a point where the rocket's moving at sort of the minimum speed during the flight, where it's slowed all the way down and it's about to start coming back. And it's at that point that you'd like to do something to the rocket. And normally what you want to do is have it separate. Maybe the nose cone pops off, which is typically what you do with the little SD sized rockets. Uh, sometimes in the larger ones, we use an ejection charge to separate the rocket you know, further back in the body tube. But in any case, you'd like to do something at Apogee to make the rocket not be um, fully aerodynamic so that it doesn't just come back in ballistically the same way it went up. Um, I've had that happen. It's not a lot of fun. Um, so what you'd really like to be able to do is deploy a parachute or a streamer or something up at Apogee. With the little rockets, what you do is you um, anticipate how long it should coast after the motor burns out before that happens, and you pick a motor that has a specified built-in uh, delay charge, which burns for that period of time and then fires a little black powder ejection charge to separate the rocket. But of course, they're not terribly predictable. We're talking about the burn rate of a delay material. Um, and it's really not a great idea with larger rockets. So in the larger rockets, we actually use a little uh, altimeter board that I'll show you some photos of here in a minute um, that have a barometric pressure sensor and a microprocessor and can determine when the air pressure has stopped going down and is starting to go back up because you've gone over at the top and use that as a trigger to eject the first part of the um, recovery system. It's also interesting that if you're building big rockets that go really high, you don't want to put a big parachute out up high because then the winds will carry them really far away from you before they come back to the ground. And in that case, we like to do something called dual deployment where uh, the rocket goes up, you separate it at apogee to keep it from being uh, totally aerodynamic and to keep it from coming back down ballistically, but it's still dropping at a very high rate of speed. And then at some predetermined altitude above the ground, the electronics detects that you're almost back to ground and initiates another event that deploys the big parachute. And when you do that, um, even if there's a lot of wind up at altitude, the rocket won't drift too far and you'll still be able to find it when it comes back to the ground. It's also fun to collect uh, flight data. Uh, the first thing people want to know is how high did it go? And in fact, you'll notice that when I show you some of our flight information, it's usually the first thing I'm interested in, too. Another question, how fast did it go? Did we break Mach? Did we go faster than the speed of sound? And yes, in high-powered model rocketry, it is very easy to build rockets that will go faster than the speed of sound on the way up as they go through their, their maximum velocity. 
uh, I myself have broken mock at least once. Um, and then it's interesting that if you have electronics that has a memory capacity and the ability to extract data after the flight, you can record this information through the whole flight and get a flight profile to study later. Um, and then the really sophisticated systems include some kind of a radio link to the ground so that while it's still up there, you can be seeing where it is, what's going on, maybe even have a GPS receiver that's reporting on the position of the rocket as it floats down uh, during the recovery phase. But, you know, even the simple data is fun. This, as I mentioned, is one of my son's rockets. It uses motor-based ejection. It's a very simple rocket. Um, but we have put a tiny little altimeter in it that I'll show you a photo of in the next slide called a PicoAlt, and that allows us to get a peak altitude reading, which it's calculating by, before launch, it sits there sort of measuring the barometric pressure and makes some determination of what the current altitude is. And then as the rocket flies, it's sitting there sampling the air pressure, and when it sees the lowest air pressure in the flight, it records that. And then after the flight, it will flash out on a little LED um, what the difference between the starting point and the highest point were. And using that technology, we know that the highest flight we've had on this rocket took it to 2,001 feet on a motor called a G77R. The R is significant to my son because that's the type of propellant in this motor. And R means uh, red line, which is a propellant that puts out a long sort of laser bright red flame out the tail of the rocket as it's going up. My son's gotten to be known in the local rocketry community as a real red line junkie. Um, <coughs> big, big motors with big red flames coming out of the back of them. Hey, Dad, can we do that again? This is what the Pico Out looks like. Again, I'm sorry, the photo on the projector is a little bit dark, but that's a pencil point over to the right to give you an idea of how big it is. There are only a few components on here. This is the little MEMS pressure sensor on one side of the board, and the other side has the microprocessor, um, an LED, surface mount LED, and a couple of resistors, and that's it. And this is something that's available commercially. It's about $40 US, I think. Um, and lots of folks in the local club have bought these since they saw us playing with them, and, and we use them a lot. I mentioned dual deploy. This was a custom rocket that I designed. It was my first dual deployment design. Um, how it got named, that's a long story. You can buy me a beer, and I'll tell you. But this one flew with a, another commercial altimeter that's a little more sophisticated called a Perfect Flight Mod <coughs> and used... Um, the ejection charges were actually made, um, you know, the little lights that people put on Christmas trees or hang up at the holidays, tiny little light bulbs. Um, by breaking the glass on one of those carefully, you can use the filament of the bulb as an igniter for a black powder charge. And these were done. Each of the ejection charges was about a half a gram of black powder. And this is a 75 millimeter diameter rocket, so it gives you some sense. It doesn't take much black powder to separate these things. And uh, the first flight of this rocket on an H-128, it went to 932 feet. And I'll show you the altitude profile I got back from the altimeter in just a minute. At a uh, later launch, about a month later, I, that was the smallest motor. The H-128 was the smallest motor this rocket was designed to fly on. The J-330 is the largest motor I had designed this rocket to fly on. And on that one, it went to 6,597 feet which is important because in the U.S., uh, uh, you know, getting at least a mile high, which is 5,280, is sort of a big deal. And uh, this took me to, you know, well over a mile. Unfortunately, on the third flight, uh, I had what we call a bucket recovery. Uh, this is when the ejection system fails to do the right thing, and uh, we watched this racket go up and come straight back down. I could hear the ejection charge for the main parachute trying to fire at 800 feet, but the rocket at that point was at terminal velocity, headed down, and uh, half gram of black powder wasn't enough to separate it. So I picked the pieces up. Uh, the only piece that's left where the blue fin can is, uh, just in front of the fins, uh, from there to the back is intact. From there to the front was all completely destroyed. Um, and there, in fact, are little pieces probably still out in the grasslands. And this is what the mod looks like. This is actually two photographs blown up a lot. It's a tiny little circuit board. Um, dip switches. This one actually uses an audible enunciator, a little 
buzzer thingy so that after the flight it beeps at you which is kind of cool you go to pick the rocket up from where it came down and it's beeping at you telling it telling you what its uh, maximum altitude was and as you can see the wires over on the right into the screw terminals are how you hook up the wires going to the ejection charges this is another photo showing how it's mounted on a little piece of used printed circuit board material with a battery that could slide into the payload bay and this is one of the uh, receptacles for the little holiday light bulbs that I was using for ejection charges. This is all cardboard tubing and uh, wooden centering, you know, plywood centering rings and bulkheads, nothing terribly sophisticated. This is a picture of it uh, under dual deployment. You can see the fin can at the bottom, the little red chute part way up was the drogue parachute that it came down from Apogee on, and the pink chute up there is the, the main parachute. I apologize for it being fuzzy, but it's the only cool picture of a dual deployment that I've flown that I have, so that's blown up a lot from an otherwise lousy photo. So, And this is what it looked like on the ground. Um, I love that shirt for two reasons uh, that my son's wearing. The first is it says, as a matter of fact, I am a rocket scientist. <laughs> <laughs> and the other reason is that it's almost a bright fluorescent yellow green and even if I'm a mile or two away across the prairie I can look back and see where he is and what he's doing back at the flight line so it's pretty handy so this is the biggest rocket that I've actually flown so far um, this one's called a vertical assault um, and it's a 75 millimeter airframe built from a kit that my wife and kids bought me for Christmas. The airframe on this one is a uh, phenolic cardboard-ish tube that's been wrapped in fiberglass um, soaked in epoxy. So it's an epoxy fiberglass over cardboard tube. And the thin assembly on this is actually a fairly high-tech composite stuff, um, high-pressure injection molded. So it's a very tough rocket um, and, and relatively inexpensive, relatively light. Um, on this one, we actually flew this on an L730, which is the largest, L motors are currently the largest ones I'm personally certified to fly. Those are the largest motors that are part of a level two certification. Um, and the cool thing is, this was up at the Pawnee National Grasslands. You get a sense there, it was dry. Uh, this was in the first weekend in May this year. But it just, it goes on for a very long distance. I mean, really is a lot like between here and Buenos Aires. So just big, wide open, pretty flat space. But the really neat thing is that day the sky was almost completely clear. And so with binoculars, I was able to watch this rocket go up and see the ejection event at Apogee at 14,141 feet. Um, fortunately, um, I had an RF beacon mounted in this one, a tiny little transmitter with an antenna wire sending out a beeping signal, because without it, I'm not sure we would have found it. It landed about a mile and a half downrange, and I had to be within 100 meters or so of it before I could even tell where it was. The, when it was laying down flat on the ground, it's almost invisible, even out in all of this prairie. Um, but that's my most significant flight so far. Uh, that's what the motor looked like. That's an L-class motor. It's a 54 millimeter diameter and, you know, yay long. Um, and for those of you who are curious, that's about $165 to fly that motor. Um, the metal casing is reusable. The fuel elements and so forth are not. And this was the altimeter that that particular rocket flew in so from a company called Missile Works. Uh, this again, that's uh, four, four squares to the inch graph paper, so you get some idea of how big that is. Um, this is another uh, interesting altimeter because it records peak velocity in addition to peak altitude. It does not give you a plot afterwards of what's going on, though. Very nice little unit, though. It costs about $75 US. So what's the problem with all of this? Well, all these altimeters are completely proprietary. Now, when we're talking about things like the little Pico out that we fly in my son's rockets, who cares? You know, it, it's a little piece of hardware. The fact that there's some firmware running in it, you don't really think about very much. It's a single task, single purpose thing. Its only goal is to tell you what the maximum altitude of the flight was. And if it does that and does it well and it's tiny and it's cheap, nobody really cares whether it's an open design or not. But it really irritates me when we get to the more sophisticated units that 
the documentation tends to be very application oriented. There's no discussion of how these things actually work. Um, some of them are sort of fiddly to configure. That Missile Works thing has two buttons and a tricolor LED and, the, and a very complex configuration menu structure. You spend a lot of time leaning on this button while you power it on and then pushing them in exactly the right sequence to get them programmed and configured. And that's okay, but it just, you know, you, you keep thinking maybe I could do this better. There's no schematics, no source code for the firmware, therefore there's really no ability to modify their behavior. And in fact, to my intense frustration, even the serial protocol for configuration and data extraction on the models that have a serial port is usually considered proprietary. Um, and the feature set that's provided by the, you know, the free Windows and Mac software they give you is pretty limited. Here's an example. Um, from that first dual deploy flight that I ever had that went to 932 feet, this is an altitude versus time plot that came from the software that extracted the recorded data from the altimeter. Now you'll notice that um, you know, the rocket goes up, comes over, there was actually an event at the top which put out a chute which caused it to come down at a certain rate of speed and then at a pre-programmed altitude which here would have been uh, whatever it was, uh, six, seven, uh, 500 feet is where it was set for. So a little bit below 500 feet, we see a change in the descent rate because the larger parachute came out and it slowed down. But you'll notice that those descent rates are penciled in by hand. Because in order to figure them out, I had to do that stuff that they taught us all in elementary school to do with a ruler and a plot like this where you kind of line it up and you see the tick marks I made and you know, you do the math in your head and I don't know, that just really irritated me. Um, so at the end of the day, to put this on this slide, this is a printout from a program running under Windows. And I've been told, yes, I could have done a screen snapshot and done something else with it. But that would require knowing how to do that on a Windows machine, which I don't know. Um, <coughs> at the end of the day, it just sort of annoys me that you know, the software doesn't have features that I'd like to have. The first question I wanted to know on a dual deployment flight was, well, what were the descent rates under the two chutes? The first thing I noticed when I did the calculation is 37 feet per second is too slow. I had too big a drogue on that. I'd like a smaller one so it's going maybe 90 or 100 feet per second. Um, so, and, and 23 and a half feet per second, not bad, but the rules for a level three certification flight say it has to be under 20. So these are the sorts of things that, you know, when I'm flying test flights, I'd like to learn quickly. So, you know, being the glutton for punishment that I am, um, and after talking to some of the manufacturers and finding out they were generally sort of uninterested in my willingness to sort of volunteer to, you know, go under NDA and write Linux software and all those sorts of things, um, I broke down and decided to design my own altimeter board and do it 100% open hardware design, open software design. The original intent was for it to be able to fit in a 24 millimeter tube, uh, primary operations based on that same kind of pressure sensor. I wanted to record profiles and not just peak altitudes so that I could gather real flight data with it, support for dual deployment. I also noticed that all of the ones that had uh, computer interfaces had some goofy little connector on board that did TTL level RS-232 or something like that. And then you then had to spend an extra pile of money to get the you know, USB to RS-232 TTL or whatever interface. Now, none of that's all of that crazy, except that there are plenty of microcontrollers available out there now that have built-in USB, and the mass of a mini USB connector is less than the mass of the doofus TTL serial connectors they were using. So. Uh, I decided the right thing to do is pick a microprocessor that had USB on it, then not only would it be easier to get the data out and to configure it, but I could actually power it from that when I recovered it uh, uh, after flight and the batteries were running down and so forth. And then I wanted to put some cool stuff in there because I wanted this to be fun, I wanted to, uh, it to be sort of interesting and educational for the local rocketry club, many of whom um, many of the members of which are families with kids about the same age as my son, uh, all of whom are sort of interested in learning uh, as we go through this process. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the hardware design. It uses a, an NXP ARM7 uh, embedded chip with a lot of I.O. on it, a separate CMOS serial EEPROM for storing the, the flight data, 
and some uh, MEM sensors. I spent some time playing with a two-axis magnetic sensor, which I thought would be cool for you know, detecting the orientation of the rocket relative to the Earth's magnetic field. And people have done that and made it work, but it turns out the circuit board surface area required for all the supporting electronics um, just seemed completely unreasonable, so I left that out. This is what the raw circuit boards look like when they came back. Um, the PC board house I'm using is a super cheap service that does two layer uh, circuit boards uh, for very low cost, um, but they have a minimum dimension that was larger than my circuit board. So I actually laid up two of them side by side on the board and after receiving them would go down and cut the two apart myself. Um, it would have helped if I had left a little bit more space between them though. <coughs> The reality is that, uh, you know, this is one of those uh, putting two of them down on a panel too late at night, doing the math in your head kind of problems. Um, by the time I snap the two boards apart, I get exactly one of two that's useful, so, you know. <laughs> one of my decisions for the next cut of the board is to just go to a slightly larger circuit board surface area so I can do one at a time, use the board shop's minimum spacing. and. Part of the reason for this is I've realized that with all of these features on here, I'm not going to fly this in a tiny little rocket with a 24 millimeter tube. I don't know what I was thinking. This is the back side of the board. It is double-sided surface mount. In order to get it to route in two layers, I did put the processor and the oscillators and so forth on the back of the board. Uh, now that I've had many more less sleepless nights to stare at the design, the next cut of the board wall have all the parts on the top surface. Um, I finally figured out what I was doing that was stupid that was making routing it so hard. You'll also notice the pads, those of you who know anything about this will notice that the pads for the passive components are downright huge looking compared to um, what else is on here. Uh, that's because I happen to have a huge pile of 1206 surface mount passive parts. That's, you know, in surface mount lingo, that's the big, huge surface mount resistors and capacitors. Um, it would certainly be easier to route the circuit board if those were smaller parts, and so I may switch to smaller ones on a future version. But as those of you who have been paying attention have noticed, I'm, you know, getting to that age and stage where optical assistance is required, so the smaller the parts get, doesn't necessarily make me happier. This is what the first board looked like uh, loaded up on the top and the bottom. Since I didn't really plan to talk about this here, I didn't bring any of the boards along to show off, which I certainly could have done. Um, the software is written mostly in C with some ARM7 assembler, runs out of the on-chip flash, um, comes up with a USB serial emulation to give you a console talking to the thing. Um, this is all done with GCC, Newlib, uh, a little operating system called FreeRTOS. How many of you have run into that? Any, anybody? For this kind of project, it's actually pretty cool. It's more or less just a you know, set of functions that are available for doing things like uh, um, time slicing, you know, a multitasking application, providing some fundamental resource allocation and so forth. It's, it's not all that great, but for this kind of thing, it seemed like a good fit. Um, and the USB stack that's been implemented for this processor family. Um, in free RTOS, the way things work is that people tend to take an evaluation board from a chip manufacturer and create a demo package of free RTOS for that board in which they write an application that exercises all of the device drivery stuff that they've turned on on the free RTOS port. In this case, uh, someone named J.C. Wren, who I've never met and never communicated with, uh, created the demo package for a particular Olamex <coughs> eval board that used the same processor chip that I started with. And that was amazingly helpful because a lot of the basic uh, things that you go through trying to light up an embedded uh, device were sort of taken care of already. Yeah. I want to spend just a moment talking about the licenses because uh, I think everyone in this room understands open source software licenses. And in fact, in this case, I chose GPL version two or later as the license for the firmware on the board. But hardware is an interesting thing to try and do something GPL-ish with. And um, a good friend of mine who's a former president of Tucson Amateur Packet Radio, which is a well-known uh, nonprofit um, engineering and design organization in the US that did lots of the early work on uh, packet radio over amateur radio links uh, leading to 
a lot of the uh, Wi-Fi and related protocols that we all sort of take for granted today. Uh, created a while back this license called the Tapper Open Hardware License. And I happen to think it's a really cool license to use for things like printed circuit board designs. It's intended to be GPL-like, but the problem is that copyright law <coughs> is sort of not the right way to tackle the problem for a hardware design. And so if you go take a look at this, there's a reference at the end of the talk. It's uh, tapr.org slash OHL, I think will get you there if you're impatient. Um, I think it's a fairly masterfully crafted license for solving this particular problem. Um, I and Bruce Perrins and various other folks that you've heard of who care about these sorts of things help to review it. And there do, does seem to be a growing community of people designing uh, small hobby and related uh, kinds of nonprofit hardware things under that license. Uh, some of the tools that I use for hardware design, I actually use the GEDA suite, uh, the GNU EDA tools. Um, GSCIM and PCB are, are really quite capable, quite functional tools. I have to tell you that um, in my history, um, back around the time I got started with the Debian project, I was managing a team that maintained all of the CAD and CAEE tools used by one of the more significant design uh, R&D labs in old test and measurement Hewlett Packard. And so I got spoiled. I mean, <clears throat> when I sit down in front of these tools, there are things that they don't do that tools we were using 10 or 15 years ago could do. Um, but at the same time, I've been really impressed with the fact that there really haven't been any roadblocks with these tools to doing, you know, useful multi-layer uh, printed circuit board, surface mount printed circuit board designs. As has always been the case, it seems like most of my time is spent creating library parts to uh, capture the physical characteristics of the different components I'm using, and much less time is spent hooking them all up and getting the board routed than you'd think. There are also some interesting tools. If you're doing hardware designs, uh, DigiKey, which is a distributor of parts in the U.S. that's well known for taking orders over the web and sending things FedEx overnight, um, has grown their website immensely, and they now have really good part selection uh, facilities and the data sheets for all their parts are online and so forth. And I think that's just really cool. The printed circuit board service that I'm using, Barebones PCB, has a thing called freedfm.com that's a design for manufacturability service where you can upload your um, printed circuit board artwork and they will run it through all of their um, rules checkers and tell you about all the things in your design that may pose problems during manufacturing, you know, copper being too close together, um, holes that are, you know, sizes that'll be hard for them to drill, things like that. And that's a free service that they provide, obviously hoping to hook you in and get you to spend money with them, which I don't really mind when somebody's providing that kind of a service. Um, from a software development standpoint, there's nothing here that any of you would uh, think are terribly unusual. I was using GDB via OpenOCD. Um, very cool that that stuff's packaged in Debian. Um, I will admit that I built the ARM cross tool chain myself um, in large part because I thought I knew how to do it and wanted to see if I still could. Um, but also because, at least on the day I went looking, uh, the tool chain stuff pointed to from MDebian and other places was frankly a little confusing to figure out. And it's one of those, I knew how to do it, I just went and did it instead of finding the right people to talk about. But there's nothing magic in this tool chain. It's just a GCC cross compiler with debugger for an ARM target. This is the actual Olamex board that JC Run wrote his uh, demo free RTOS package for. Um, I got one of them, and over on the right in the prototyping area, you can see a little prototyping board with a three-axis accelerometer and the memory chip uh, stuck down up in the corner. And I actually did quite a bit of the initial software development on this board while I was waiting for uh, to, to sort of get done with the printed circuit board design and get all the parts back in the build. Uh, that's an Olamex ARM debugging dongle. Nothing super great about it, except this particular unit's kind of cool because it hangs on a USB port on your notebook, and in addition to providing the JTAG microprocessor programming and debugging interface, it also has a USB serial port built in and a switching power supply that will give you um, power to power your target system off of the USB spigot. So it eliminates having to carry all sorts of bits and pieces around. 
cable I had to make up to interface that. Oh, um, some people who have played around with building hardware things at home have this mental model that somehow uh, surface mount is impossible to do at home. And I really beg to differ with that. I think it's much easier to design and build things using surface mount components than through hole components because you're not constantly having to flip the circuit board back and forth to get to both sides of the board all the time. I mean, it sounds kind of silly. I just happen to think it's true. The only challenge I had is that the accelerometer is in a leadless part called a QFN. It's not quite as bad as a ball grid array that has lots of hidden pads on the bottom, but these are just flat pads around the outside edge of the part on the bottom of the part. There's no way to get to them with a soldering iron. But I discovered that you can actually, for a couple hundred dollars, buy a hot air reflow setup that works pretty well. <coughs> you have to have good tweezers, and at my age, having your uh, wife and kids buy you a really nice trinocular microscope for as a Christmas present, totally winning. <coughs> As you can see, there's a pair of tweezers in the circuit board down at the bottom. Uh, with this, it's really easy to do uh, close-up, very uh, fine-pitched work. Um, so yes, you have to get a few tools to play with really tiny circuitry stuff at home, but um, I don't consider it hugely difficult. In fact, as I said, I think it's easier than some of the things I used to do with through-hole parts. So where am I in the process? Well, I showed you some photos of the first article PC board. That was uh, completely assembled, mostly tested, and I talked about it in uh, Australia at the beginning of the year. There are enough problems with that board, um, with this sort of VO.1 board, that I have not actually released all of the design files for it. The reason for that is I really don't want anybody to waste time trying to duplicate that, um, because I do think it would be a waste of time. And unfortunately, the first article PC board was damaged before I actually got to fly it. I keep debating with myself whether it's worth loading up another one and redoing all of the various hacks I had to do to the board to make it work, or if I should just um, get on with doing the version 0.2s. If I ever stay home long enough, I'll get some more printed circuit boards cut and uh, try and get some of these flown. Um, but as I pointed out at the beginning of my talk at the, uh, earlier in the week uh, with a couple photos, this project that I'm involved in right now to build an airframe for getting the last and final level of high power certification, the level three certification, is kind of got my mental priority at the moment. There are a bunch of changes I'm making in the board design. I'm going to fix all the known uh, issues. The only one that's lingering is I've got a goofiness with the LED that tells you whether the USB is happy or not I need to figure out. I may go to smaller passive parts, though I haven't done that yet making the board a little bit bigger so it's easier to get the boards made. Um, I oopsed on some pinouts on connectors that, in ways that I think are worth fixing. I also had a suggestion in Australia, at Linux Conf Australia in January, that I go investigate the LiPo lithium polymer battery technology. I didn't realize that um, people were making good little charging chips for LiPo cells and so forth, but they are. There's a single chip solution that's five pins and trivial to use that will charge a LiPo battery. One of the nice things about LiPo batteries is that they're all 3.7 volts and they only differ in the total charge capacity. So you can design for a small battery and if you need more current, you just put a bigger one in. <coughs> um, and a bunch of the guys in the local club said, um, this is really cool, but um, where's the LED or the buzzer that tells you how high it went after the flight? And I said, oh, well, you just plug into the USB. And they said, no, 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 no. <laughs> if it doesn't beep, it's not an altimeter. And so um, <clears throat> I, I've gotten some sample parts, and I'll figure out what to do about that before long. Um, I think it would be fun at some point to do some variants. I've got a friend right now helping me to integrate some cheap surplus GPS receiver boards that we came across, cheap as in under $20 for a nice integrated core. And um, we're hoping actually to fly that as a payload during my level three certification flight in about a month, but uh, we'll see how that goes. I do think it would be fun to do um, some simpler versions of this board once this one's working um, that would make it easier for some of the kids to fly them in smaller uh, rockets and so forth. Uh, at this point, 
you know, I've probably got a minute or two left for some questions. The information on this um, more can be found at these places. Um, altusmetrum.org, I registered to be the place for the altimeter. It's a pretty bare website right now because, as I mentioned, I really don't want anyone wasting time trying to duplicate the VO.1 work. The couple people who are directly collaborating with me on um, getting version 0.2 together or doing so directly and not using the website at the moment, but that is where all of this stuff will get published as soon as I have something that I think it's worth people duplicating. Um, Gag.com slash rockets has the uh, status updates and design file for my level 3 rocket, if any of you are curious about that. As I already mentioned, the open hardware license is out on the Tapper website. So with that, I'll thank you for your time and attention. I think we're more or less out of time, but if anybody has a burning question, feel free. Okay, well, I'll be around the rest of the evening and a little bit tomorrow morning, so if this is fun stuff and you'd like to ask questions about it, feel free to catch me. Thank you very much. Thanks.